We thank you, Holy Spirit, so much for your presence this morning in our midst. Thank you, Jesus, truly, for your that you fulfill your promise that as we worship, you come and are enthroned in our midst. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are a teacher. I pray now you will come and speak to us through this word that you yourself have authored. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open our minds and our spirits to what you want to share with us, what you want to speak to us, even command us, convict us of this morning. I surrender myself to your purposes. In Jesus' name, Amen. So as I said, we are in 2 Samuel chapter 5, but I want to give a bit of background. Uh, where we are in the story is that David, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David is finally, is actually anointed king over Judah after Saul's death. Only Judah and Benjamin accept him as king, while the remaining 10 tribes stay with Saul's family. And for seven and a half years, there is civil war in Israel between the houses of David and Saul. And finally, we see in the beginning of chapter 5 that David is finally anointed king over all Israel. And in a sense, and that leads to the next step, which is that he captures Jerusalem. And all this time, Joshua entering the land, all those years that Joshua was in charge and the judges and all of that, this particular place has not yet been captured. And we know after that how significant Jerusalem was to God's purposes. So David is anointed king over all Israel. He goes on to capture uh, this place which then he calls Jerusalem and makes it the capital of Israel. And in a sense at this point, that is by, by verse 15 or 16 when he has, he is anointed king over all Israel and also he is, he's got Jerusalem, he makes it his residence, all of that. He is in a sense arrived at the place of his assignment. He has come into the place. He is set for his role in God's purposes as king over all Israel from Jerusalem, which then was also a part of it is called Zion, the city of David. Okay. And to rule from Jerusalem or Zion. And it's so interesting because as he comes into this place of his assignment or his role, for the first time since he became king of Judah at least, the Philistines attack Israel. Till now they stayed away and they watched all this internal fighting going on and now David is king over all Israel and they attack. And we want to look at these, Just there are two attacks in this chapter, we want to look at them, especially the second one, to look at David's responses to these attacks and we can learn how to deal with attacks in our assignments as well as how to proceed when things seem tough. Okay, I just feel God is speaking to us concerning the things He is asking us to do, the assignment that He has given us or is giving us. And um, sometimes there is direct opposition, sometimes it's just that things are tough or it seems that this task seems impossible or this particular hurdle seems too much for me to overcome. And I believe what God wants to give us a strategy, shall we say, to deal with, with such things. Okay, so we'll read first from 17 to 21 and look at the first attack briefly before going to the second attack. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned the idols there and David and his men carried them off. Okay, so this first attack from the Israelites, from the Philistines, and we see a couple of things there that we'll see it again, so I just want to go briefly over it. So firstly, David inquired of the Lord, and we see from 
1 Samuel in 1 Samuel when David is a uh, refugee from Saul when he's fighting the Philistines and other other Canaanites we see this practice early as well that often he inquired of the Lord before doing something I'll flesh it out a bit later secondly we see that God answers in the affirmative and then David steps out in obedience to his word and thirdly we see that David and his army fight the battle they, God says go they go they fight the battle but David gives the credit to the Lord he says the Lord broke out against them so did something supernatural happen we don't know but it's interesting the language there I will hand them over to you David asks will you hand them over to me as far as he's concerned the Philistines are in God's hands the Philist Philistines are in his God's hands it's up to God to hand them over to him or not and so he, he said you know so anything that we're struggling with it's already in God's hands God is sovereign over that situation that person that persecutor that opposition that obstacle he's already sovereign over it David is only asking will you hand it over to me will you give it to me will you deal with it right now in this case God says yes David goes we don't know what happens but as far as David is concerned the Lord broke out against the Philistines and even calls that place Baal Perazim which means the Lord who breaks out so something supernatural must have happened why do I say that because of what we are told next as it's, it's quite a mighty victory because the, with that last line over there that the Philistines abandoned their idols and David and his men carried them off uh, in triumph let's go to the second attack which I want to focus on today once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephaim so David inquired of the Lord and he answered do not go straight up but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees and a lot of virgins say mulberry trees I have no idea what trees they are as soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees move quickly because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army so David did as the Lord commanded him and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon together four things I want to share from this section firstly David inquired again you know he didn't take anything for granted based on his previous experience I mean he's just had he's just had exactly the same experience the same situation the Philistines come they spread out in the valley of Rephaim in the same way and he's already had one amazing victory over them but he doesn't take it for granted he doesn't think I'll do the same thing again it's quite clear in the first instance there is a full frontal attack against the army and David wins a mighty victory he doesn't think I'll just do the same thing again he again inquires of the Lord and God gives him a plan how did he inquire I just want to just share that briefly because how did God inquire when we look in the earlier chapters we see that he would call the priest and the ephod this appears to be the priest ephod which had the urim and the thummim which were two things that God had told Moses to make by which the priest would inquire of the Lord and he would answer and that seems to be what David does so he inquires of the Lord and he receives God's plan that's the second step he receives God's plan and that plan is completely different from the earlier plan so it's interesting that you know the people said of the Urim and Thummim what you got from them was yes and no answer so, so the priest had to ask questions of God and it, it seems to be like a lot or something and God would say yes or no so you would ask, have to ask the right question God would say yes or no but in this case clearly God is saying more than yes or no because he gives them a, he gives them a clear strategy a tactic for the battle okay so either God spoke directly to David or I think more likely he spoke through the priest or he spoke through a prophet and we see later on many times that God does speak to, more, to David through a prophet 
either way david clearly receives god's plan and then the third step is going in accordance with that plan okay and so we see here david and his army are told to go not from from the front but to go at the side and hide somewhere and wait david has to wait and god says wait until you hear the sound of marching today my today's sermon actually is called the sound of marching it says as soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tree tops you know some commentators say that that was the wind blowing in the tree tops and it sounded like marching i don't think david and his soldiers would have mistaken wind in the tree tops for the sound of marching they knew exactly what marching sounded like okay now it could have been just the sound of marching you know in 2 kings chapter 7 verse 6 god actually does that he scares an army by just the sound of marching there's actually no army there we are told that but he he gives them the sound as if there are there's a mighty army coming and the enemy gets scatters okay however what is clear to me in this situation is that this is the sound of an actual army marching in fact the words the the words are the sound of stepping that is the actual hebrew word when we hear the sound of steps or stepping in the top of the trees okay and i believe therefore this is an actual army that is marching on top of the tree tops we have examples of that we know elisha what he could see and what he then prayed for his servant to see the servants are an actual army heavenly army the chariots with fiery chariots uh, in 2 kings 19 there's another story where one angel of the lord comes and kills 185000 assyrian soldiers who have who have surrounded jerusalem because it was not god's plan for the assyrians to conquer jerusalem So in one night, one angel kills 185,000 Assyrians. We don't know how he did that. It could have, it could have been, could even have been just a, a plague or anything. But it happened overnight. Okay, so an angel physically has come and done that. So there is good evidence of angelic activity on the earth, angelic armies in the Bible. And I, I believe this is what God is saying here because of the language that He uses. He doesn't just say that. you will hear the sound of marching he says what it will mean is the lord has gone out in front of you so we have an angelic army with the lord at the head of it and god is telling david wait until you hear the sound of my army moving and until then don't do anything and just think for a minute david and his army they are all flushed from the previous battle they had a mighty victory which 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 is actually emphasized by the fact that they carried off the idols of the philistines they were so scared the philistine they couldn't even pick up the idols and go and so david and his army with this wonderful victory behind them are standing and doing nothing they are waiting for a sound And it's very easy at that point to start to hear the other voices. The soldier saying, "What's happening here? I think David has lost it this time. We're just waiting here, doing nothing. Let's just go. We 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 thrashed them the last time. We can do it again. It was so easy last time." Go. David's commanders might say something to him. The voices in his own head was that really God? The very strange thing he told us to do. But David has to wait. until the lord at the head of his angelic army goes and god strikes first what's the next thing the fourth one is david had to advance quickly and decisively once he heard the sound okay and by the way that's also very important because david had to move after god moved but before he attacked so as soon as he hears the sound move which means that when david starts moving nothing has happened to the army yet god has gone god has gone ahead of him but hasn't started attacking yet david has to move 
in faith based on what God told him rather than what he can see. And when he does that, he reaps an earthly reward for what heaven has accomplished. Because the Lord went ahead of him at the head of an angelic army, the Lord struck first, David goes behind God and mops it up basically. And he gets all the reward, he gets the earthly victory, he gets the plunder, he gets the fame and reputation, he gets all of that. But he had to first wait to hear the sound, to trust God and to let God move ahead of him and then move. Okay. What about us? God is speaking to us, but maybe we may not be standing in front of a huge army. But sometimes the obstacles feel like that. Impossible to overcome. Impossible to overcome the opposition or the obstacle or the hurdle or whatever God has given to us. It, it, it can be even something as simple and we all know that's not simple as sharing the gospel with a family member. But those are also assignments. Okay. Whether it is that or evangelizing a nation, it's the same principle. Firstly, we need to inquire of God. Not once in a while, but every time. We need to receive His plans and ideas. Not go with what worked last time. Not go with... Forget about our own ideas. Even something God said last time that worked. We can't just go with that. It becomes very easy to fall into that kind of a... Uh, routine or rut or... Uh, a comfortable place to be, a comfortable way to function. You know, whether it, I mean, we can say it about about any work or job as well. If you're not being challenged, just fallen into something comfortable. So much more in following Jesus. You know, are you taking risks? Are you having to step out in faith rather than just carry on? It's so. I, I think that. God pushing us out of all saints and just it's always be in a situation where we've got to trust Him. In fact, Anne was saying the other day that you know being pushed. I mean, she had two, three more months of comfort in all saints after highway started. Then she too was pushed out. You know, everything had to go by faith. What is God saying? Where is He taking us? How does He want us to do this? And you just get comfortable with something and then something, God pushes you further. Okay. He wants us to inquire of Him, receive His strategy for doing things and then move out. Okay. God says that He is going to go ahead of us. So the important thing here is that we should not go ahead of Him. Then we are sure to fail. Why would we want to go ahead of him? He said, I'm go, I'll go ahead of you and I'll do the work. But so often, in our independence, in our ego, in our comfort level, and in our, really in our stupidity, we just go ahead of him and just try to do things. And even if they succeed, they're not really the best that God would have in that situation. We want and God is saying, I will go ahead of you. And I was... Uh, on Sundays, I normally in the mornings I hear some somebody's sermon. I have a, two or three people that I hear, and uh, today I heard a sermon that I thought didn't relate at all to the topic. I was going to preach on sound of marching, and the topic was on something else. Uh, the name of the topic was the Holy Spirit and angels, or something like that. Anyway, I heard the talk, and I was so surprised how God affirmed what He was saying here because He was talking. Uh, Tim Sheets was talking about angelic activity and he was talking about how, how angelic armies are at work in the lands and of course that is what I believe God is saying to us that as we carry out our assignments angelic armies are at work they are doing the work ahead of us however we should not go ahead of God but once God moves we shouldn't hesitate and fall behind then we've got to move in faith once we discern that God has started His work, 
no? we have to move in faith sometimes we may not even see the result immediately but we move in faith and we uh, we move into that situation and let god guide us now as i say all these things you realize that except for the actual moving part all the rest of it prayer is at the heart of that when we are inquiring of god when we are listening to his strategies when we are discerning when he has moved all of that really comes in the place of prayer it comes in the place of intimate relationship we want to be in that place where we are able to hear god we are sensitive not just to his voice to his leading to his moving jesus said i only do what i see the father doing it's the same principle the father had already begun a work and then jesus did that we see the same with the apostles you know, they they would they would look at somebody they didn't heal everybody they looked at somebody paul says paul is preaching and he says he looks at a man and he saw that he had faith to be healed i don't know what that means i don't know what he saw but he discerned that god had already begun a work in that man and he was able to say get up and so as we pray you know as as we step out into our assignments and as we are praying let's let's, let's understand this thing that god is at work his angelic army is at work and they will do the work before we do something on the earth but we need to be in that place of dependence of trust of faith you know depending on him uh, inquiring of him receiving receiving guidance every time just not taking anything for granted you know there's so much because we are made in god's image we have a spirit god's gifts and calling are irrevocable there's so much we can do in our own strength and think it's god and that's the most frightening thing actually and i know there's criticism which is not which which is not uh, misplaced i suppose that you can you can have this wonderful uh, setup for worship and you can have the smoke and this and that and you can get the atmosphere or you can trust in god i'm not saying that's bad i mean it's wonderful i, I mean let's be as excellent as we can be in all that we do but still our trust is god i want your presence to be that thing that causes people to cry and weep and laugh and all of that not something that i am manufacturing with my with my human atmosphere but at the end of the day i want your presence there and this morning as i prayed for the service i didn't have any illustration as such and it's okay i mean sometimes i don't get anything to say but god brought to my mind a story which i know that a lot of you here know but it's so interesting because and but since he brought it to my mind i'm going to share it and realize that god is actually showing me that that's what happened that time i had an inkling of that but not so clear it's a story that those of you from all since time will know for sure uh, but i realized last week last sunday i was in pune and i shared this with stella and she, i realized that she had not heard that so i realized there may be people who don't know it but i think it fits very nicely with this thing so you will you, some of you will know that i had a i had a flat in when my mother passed away my father passed away 6 7 months from each other we had these properties we had a flat in pune and we had a farm uh, outside ambadnagar and my my mother had an ashram on the farm and this person who worked with my mother stole it he transferred it in his name what's called the sat bara he got it transferred in his name and i did nothing when my until my father passed away and then when we started looking at the property we realized that he had already transferred it to his name okay and so we had the house and there was some i mean the 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 society was being very uh, negligent in giving us a share certificate for the society for the flat and there the farm had been transferred into this person's name and we decided at that point not to do not to do anything about it because he was still running the ashram and we said if he's doing something good he's using that place fine we were not going to do anything with that property anyway a, a year or so later i get a call from 
my neighbor the flat in Pune that somebody has broken into the flat and taken it over so i went off to pune and found that it was this man he had he he had basically forged the will in my mother's name with false witnesses everything and the the will said that the flat and the ashram and everything were for him and so he's come to my flat to the society he's come and he's broken the lock he entered my house he brought a tempo taken all my stuff out of the house put it in the tempo and carted it off somewhere all the papers everything uh, and he set up the house for himself he put up photos of him and his wife as if that's where they were staying he took videos of the house this was all with the lawyer giving him directions how he should set up everything so that to show it's his house and anyway, we i went there to 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 pune and i saw him he's in the house he had these gundas who were standing in the balcony and there was really nothing i could do uh i went to the police station and they did not uh, they did not entertain me they said go to show you go to court and ask them to do something i said he didn't go to court he broke the lock and went in it didn't matter later on we found out he had paid them off and all that so even though one of the police inspectors was the person i had grown up with all my life who stayed in the same society as me we we grown up together he didn't even look in my direction when i was in the police station so you know everybody in the in the society knew i i told the policeman i said come to my society and talk to people for 5 minutes i've grown up in this house uh, anyway it didn't matter they were not willing to uh, now at that time uh, this is husband jeevan i think he had retired by then but he knew he knew he obviously he, he was acp here so he was he knew people in pune he sent me a number of somebody and i called this person he was high up he was high up in the police and he was extremely helpful the next day i went and met the acp acp is just below the cp there are there are one commissioner of police and there are three acps i actually went and met there for the second level of a policeman and uh, he said yes yes your case is very good he called the person who was above the what is it called chowki which is supposed responsible for my area and he told him that i'm sending a person to you his case is very valid please deal with it you will not believe it i went and met that person and he was so rude to me and he told me to get out of his office okay and when i called the acp and said he did this he said i can't believe it he couldn't believe that the, his subordinate had not even bothered about what he his recommendation and was instead supporting the chowki havaldar anyway so that happened and uh, I was not really sure what to do next. I called, I mean, I called the the other the Jeevan's contact again, and he was quite surprised also. That night, that evening, some of you will know this. I was standing in my society, the second floor is my flat, looking at my flat, wondering what do I do. Okay, and uh, suddenly God showed me that this person had gone come to Bombay actually and done some black magic. said okay i i message i called anila told her sent her everybody a message say that this has happened i don't know i don't i don't know i didn't know the details i said he i said i feel this has happened and we have to pray against it okay i think that was the place of god showing me what needed to be done see there was a lot happening already the level of the level of influence that i had used by, at that point was incredible and yet nothing moved you know this is a normal thing to do and i'm i'm thanking god i'm thanking god for jeevan and his contact and the acp that i met and all of that and and we say yes god is at work doing that and yet nothing you know god had to show me the obstacle we had to pray and then god had to move in the heavens you see the angelic armies had to deal with and that's what he showed me today angelic armies dealt with that thing which could not be dealt with by even the highest policeman it was literally a situation where the second highest authority was unable to budge the chowki havaldar it was a absolutely bizarre situation okay so so we i sent a message out anila must have sent it to everybody that time it was all same so half of you may not have been there and people might have may remember praying against this uh, 
demonic thing, whatever it was. Um, the next morning, I'm, I, and I was just, I was just wandering around my society every day, not knowing what to do. So I'm standing at the gate of the society, and this young boy comes up to me, and he calls me Dada. I can't recognize him. He was one of the boys my mother had picked up and taken to the ashram and taken care of. So he must have seen me once or twice I went to the ashram. They called her I, so he was calling me Dada, big brother. And I didn't recognize him, he recognized me and he came and said, I know I know you, I had taken care of me and this and that. So this so Matthew has come sorry, I don't want to say his name. This man has come from the uh, not bad till now I didn't say it. This man had come from the uh, ashram and brought this boy with him to help out in the house like a servant or whatever and the boy has gone shopping or something and he sees me at the gate and we just talk for a minute or two he said I know you I and Dada and all that and I say good and I didn't know I mean I just said hello whatever and he went in to the house so uh, so that happened and I didn't give it much thought but angelic armies were at work. In the evening, uh, for some reason, I somebody told me that Matthew had <laughs> that this man had this man had left the house for something. So I went to the so I went to the went to the house and rang the bell. Okay. And there was a grill, so the door is open. The grill is kept locked, and this boy is there. So what has happened is this, this man with his wife and the lawyer have gone to the court to get what is called a status quo order, which means that as the situation is now, that's how it will be until the court decides the situation, which we know takes 15 to 20 years for any of these cases to get resolved. So the order says, whoever is occupying the house at this moment, that's, that's the way it stays until the court decides what happens. And if, if you know, in, in India at the moment, there are three crore pending cases. My grandfather's father, great-grandfather's property is still in dispute in the farm, outside the farmland. So you can imagine what would have happened with this particular case. Uh, so they've all gone and they've left this boy to take care of the house. And he says, uh, I've been told not to open the door. I said, you know who I am? He said, yes. You know whose house this is? He said, yes. So I said, then open the door and let me into my house. He opened the door and he let me in. And his grandmother stayed in Pune. So I gave him money. I said, go to your grandmother. Don't stay with this man. Go to your grandmother. And he left. Five minutes later, this man appeared with a court order case. With the court order. The status quo order. I was in the house and he was outside the house. He was mad, livid. He called the society people. They said, they said, but we know him. It's his house. The police came. They never came and I called them. They came and he called. He's standing down. He and his wife and the lawyer are standing down with their court order. And I'm in my house. The police came. They entered my house. They said, you have to leave. I said, no, I'm in the house. I called this man, Jeevan's contact. He said, he gives them the phone, he gives them such a blasting, they all left. And you know, to have somebody, I call uh, some senior officer, they don't have time for you usually. Once you can get in touch with them, you can't talk to them after that. Every time I called him, he took my call. Once he was having bath, he called me back. You know, anybody knows with senior officials, they never have the time for you like this. So he blasted them, they were asked to leave and he told me, don't leave your house, as long as you're in your house, they can't enter. For the next week, that, that night, policemen slept in my house as protection. That next whole week, they had these commando units who were patrolling. The commando units would come by every night and check on me and see that I was okay. And then after we found, we, we for the next few months, we just got a caretaker to come and stay in the house. For one month, I was, one week I was there. I don't know, Weber came for a day or two and stayed. Dilip came for a couple of days and stayed with me. I was going crazy sitting in the house day and night. 
then we hired a watchman he came to stay in the house day and night he got crazy after a month or two he said i can't handle it anymore we got a second guy to come and stay and for three or four months the house was uh, the main thing was keep it occupied then he can't come in okay the end of that year december early january maybe this man comes to me comes to bombay and says can i meet you i said sure we meet and he says that uh, i'm very sorry i'll give it back to you okay i'm very sorry take back the police case because there was a i mean i'd filed something obviously it was lying there the police case he said please take back the police case i said i said i won't i won't uh, do anything about the case i said but i want a i want an affidavit from you that you forged the will in my mother's name and that's not a that and that you that's not a correct will he gave me an affidavit i have an affidavit where somebody is admitting to a crime he admitted that the flat was not his and the farm was not his i got the farm back it had already gone into his name i got it back in my name and then i sold it off anybody who knows how property things work in india you cannot imagine that i that by the end of that month i had got my farm back in my name i had got my my flat was already there but it i now had the affidavit that he had no rights over the over my flat everything got taken care of no and today god is telling me that what happened when you all prayed that i did something in the heavens and an angelic army moved and and in a sense i didn't i actually i actually moved after that without even realizing i was supposed to move when i went to the house and rang the bell but the work had already been done you know god had already moved for david and david had to just go and finish the job and god had already moved in a situation where the policeman and nobody could do anything and after that i moved just as a little aside uh, 15 years later i got a official looking letter in marathi which i didn't understand what it was saying also it was telling me i had to appear in court in pune for something i didn't understand what this was about anyway off i went to pune i appeared in court you know what the case was that case it was the first hearing of that case 15 years later you know what would have happened to the house would have been sold off by then uh and of course i told them no no and the first question they asked so they know what's happening these guys this our, our system is so bad you want the case to continue i said no take it that's the first question they asked everybody when so cases are coming so late they know that everything may have changed by then but but god works so amazingly you know and the the, the switch happened when we realized that there was something else at work and angelic armies had to get involved not a clear influence god has amazing assignments powerful things he wants each one of us to do and whether it's opposition or whether it's hurdles or obstacles god is saying inquire of me receive my strategy and then hear the sound of marching of course it won't be a sound it will be something else you see something whatever when i move then you move in faith let me bring it down to a very simple example we are praying for our loved ones to be saved <coughs> something has to happen so well, god is saying pray and inquire of me what do i do and he'll tell you what to do there is no standard plan for everybody it's different for everyone and then he'll prepare the way before you <coughs> but at that point you have to go and get the word and whether it's telling that person that that is, this is the moment to tell them about the gospel or this is that moment god opens to pray for that person or whatever it is i've brought it out to a very small thing it could be anything god is saying to do okay i believe god is saying that this is what happens he showed david something that happens <coughs> every time we pray angelic armies move and they start doing the work on our behalf and then we are called to move in faith
And Lord, I pray for each one of us, Lord, and the assignments that you've laid on our hearts. They could be specific assignments, it could be something as general as seeing our loved ones come to know you. For we know that you want none to perish. And Lord, I pray for each one of us, Lord, that you will so anoint our prayer lives. Take them to that next level, Lord. Where as we inquire of you, we will receive clear guidance. Increase our sensitivity to how you move, Lord, and when you move. And then give us faith to move at the same time. But I thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in our lives. And I thank you for the amazing things that are, that are about to as happened with David, break out as you break out. In Jesus' name, Amen.